Thanks very much for inviting me to this. Um, so I'm going to give a talk about three-dimensional electron tomography. And this will be one uh, lesson that's mainly the, um, the theory of electron tomography and some of the, the practical aspects. And then I'll, I'll give some more practical things in the second one later. But um, so I, as it was said, I work at the National Center for Electron Microscopy, NCEM. And it's a user center that allows people from all over the world um, to submit proposals and then come use our electron microscopes. And I'll talk about that just a little bit at the end of the, of the, of the course, at the end of this session. Um, so I'm a staff scientist there, and I've been there since 2009. And my main uh, um, project is working with users and then also doing electron tomography. So let's get into things. So mainly, um, looking at uh, scanning transmission electron microscopy, that's what I mainly use because I mainly do uh, material science. So I won't be talking very much about bio biological materials, and we'll mainly be talking about STEM. So here I show just a few different images of um, materials that you might want to look at, structures. So we can look at the atomic structure of materials, like these lead sel selenide nanoparticles um, with ligands on the outside of the particle. We can look at buried uh, inclusions, like this lead particle within an aluminum matrix. Um, we can also look at new materials, like gold particles, 5 nanometer gold particles that are included in this block copolymer, which is two types of uh, carbon that self-assemble into a very uh, ordered structure. And you can put particles in inside there. We can look at um, um, multi-layers of objects, where you can have single layers of, of one material uh, surrounded by a, a single layer of another material, where you can very precisely control how you build this structure up. Um, we can look at magnetic reed heads, like uh, this is in, in an integrated circuit. So this is actually the thing that uh, your, your spinning disk that actually reads all the bits off of your hard drive. So we can look at those kind of structures. And then uh, one of the most uh, one of the most complicated things, or very complex things, are just the copper wires or the interconnects that connect the transistors in, in your computer chips uh, to all the other transistors. So you have multiple multiple layers of all these things. And what we can tell is that from these from these pictures, um, each one of these pictures is just a two dimensional projection of what is actually a very complex three dimensional structure. Like this nanoparticle here actually has facets, which you can get some sort of idea of. You get flat sides on this. But what does the object actually look like in three dimensions? The, the, the actual orientations and number of those facets and the sizes really matters how this object will interact with the real world and how we can use it to make better batteries or to make stronger materials like these inclusions here. So although we can get down to the atomic structure of materials and we can look at long range interactions between materials, between structures, if we just have a two-dimensional projection of that object, we won't really be able to figure out what the full structure of that, of that object is. All right, this works. So this gets to the fact that projections are misleading. And if you have some sort of source, and you shine it on an object, and you can only look at the projection through that object or the shadow on the wall, then you might grossly misinterpret what this object is in the center that you're actually looking at. So you might think you're looking at a hand when actually it's some more complex object that's trying to fool you. Okay, so we, as a microscopist, we study the shadows on the wall because we do not have access to the objects that create them. But if we get a little creative with how we actually take this data, then we can actually start seeing more of how this, this structure is actually created. So the projection problem for TEMs has been well known for a really long time. And if we look at some kind of silly structure here that has a few different objects in it, if we were to look in, uh, in projection, then we could tell the distance between these two objects. But we might, might not be able to tell where they are within the relation of the thickness. And if we look at the thickness of this, a projection uh, of this object, of this object, and this object, these all give exactly the same picture. But you can tell that it's very different whether you have this round, this round particle inside this other structure, above or below it, or, or inside of it. So all these things become really important. So electron tomography is a method in which a higher dimensional structure, a 3D structure, for, say, is reconstructed from a series of lower dimensional projections. It's usually by sampling the structure from many different orientations. And then the original description of this, is in a pro, uh, uh, of this projection problem, is in uh, Radon's 1917 paper, which you can see here. And it was originally developed for astronomy, so they could kind of figure out um, how far away objects are, because they only have one single object. but the, the uh, Earth goes around the sun, so we can get different projections at different points that it goes around the sun. Um, 
And it's very commonly used in medical CAT scans. So usually they put you on a bed and they spin this thing around you and they're actually taking different images of you so that they can build up three-dimensional reconstruction. And then what you can really do is any series of projection images can be utilized. So you don't even have to look in just the TEM literature. You can look in other fields like biology, astrology, medical imaging. All these things can be used once you have just a projection of a structure. So in an electron tomography experiment, I'm just going to go over just the very basics. So here's kind of a graphic of what's actually going on. Here we have our object here, and we shine an electron beam on it. And we tilt this object to many different orientations. So we get what's called a tilt series of images. And you can have um, maybe 70 to 140 images in this tilt series, something like that. And for the best results, we want to acquire as many images as possible over as large a tilt range as possible. And this will become uh, more clear uh, as I go through the, uh, through the lecture. And then this really means that in practice, we take about one projection every one or two degrees with about a two degree increment from plus and minus 70 degrees. So that's where I come up with about 70 degrees if you use two degree increments, up to about 140 images uh, if you take the two degree increments. And then what we do is we take this tilt series and we put it in a computer and we align all of these images uh, to a common line so that they all rotate properly around each other. And then uh, we reconstruct this using algorithms in the computer to give a three-dimensional representation of the volume of the object. You don't only get the surface of the object because we're projecting through it, we also get the center of the object. So we can look at buried interfaces or buried structures in, in the object. So you can see the full three-dimensional uh, view of the object. And this requires very accurate spatial alignment of all of these images, a determination of the tilt axis around which they rotated, and then very accurate angular increments. So that's very important to have a microscope that has a very good, uh, what's called a goniometer, so that when you tilt one degree, you actually do tilt one degree. Let's bring this over here so I can look at it. There we go. So what really all you need is called the projection requirement. So what we're assuming is that each one of these images that we take at different tilt angles is actually a projection of the actual structure. And so the projected intensity must be a monotonic function of some property of the object. Usually we use mass and, or thickness and or thickness, but you could also think of you can get the electric potential out of something if you used something like off-axis off holography. If you can get the sum, summed electric potential and you could do it at a lot of different angles, then you can figure out what the actual three-dimensional electric potential of the object is. And what we really rely on in most of electron tomography is Beer's law, where you get uh, an intensity that dies off pretty much exponentially with the thickness of the object, and it's related to the scattering cross-section of the, of the object. Um, so TEMs are, in fact, a structure projector under certain conditions. If you're using phase contrast uh, for crystals, though, that's not really correct because you get diffraction contrast. So people went to uh, ADF stem to produce incoherent Z contrast of, of, of materials. TEM works very well for biological materials, but not very well for material structures. TEM, you're in biology, you're looking at carbon. It's all carbon. So if you have something that's a slightly different type of carbon, then phase contrast will give you a very good idea of what that is. But in, in um, uh, material science, we really need to go to ADF stem, uh, annular dark field stem, to do that. So what we're actually doing is we're doing a projection operation. So we have some object, and we can describe this object's density by a discretized function. So we can say it has a function of, of the three spatial coordinates, and then we can say what is the mass or what is the thickness of the object, what is the mass of that object at that position. So then if we take some sort of irradiation and we shine it through the sample, then that irradiation is going to be um, more strong where the object is thinner and less strong where it's thicker. Um, or depending on what your actual, uh, you'll get more scattering where it's thicker and less scattering where it's thinner. So it depends on what kind of detector you use at the bottom. So this projection uh, is similar to just a summation of the thickness or the mass of that object along a different direction. So if we integrate this function along dz, say, along the projection direction, then it just becomes a summation and we just get an, a function of xy. So we turn a three-dimensional object into a lower dimensional object. It's a two dimensional object, a projection. And this works also at different angles. So we can do this at any different angle. So we don't just get a function of x, y. We can also get a function at all kinds of different angles. And that will be, this function is going to be different because the object will be thicker or thinner here depending on which way it's oriented. So here's just a really simple example. 
So we can look at three projections of this really simple object at three different orientations. So we have just this triangle of round objects. And if we look at zero degrees, we can see that they're evenly spaced along that direction. But if we were to just use this single projection object, we'd have no idea what their relative heights was to each other. But if we take some images at different orientations, we can see that this projection shows us that these are closer together, and this is farther away now. And then if we tilt it the other way, that these are closer together, and these are farther away. So now, as we get different tilt angles, each tilt tells us a little bit more about the distribution and shape of the objects underlying it. Okay? So every single angle that we get, we get a little more information. And we can build that up, and then we can put that in the computer and reconstruct what our actual object is. So we can go from 1D to 2D to 3D Fourier transforms. Um, so an ob a 3D object with a density function like this, f of xy, let's just go with a 2D object. Going to 3D is very trivial. You just add a third dimension. Um, and this can also be rep represented in what's called reciprocal space. So this is a function of intensities or, or mass that's located in different positions. But we can also decompose this, decompose this into the frequencies that that object is actually made of. So if you take the Fourier transform, you get out a Fourier transform which is now in spatial frequency coordinates rather than in actual mass density coordinates. So we can do this also just going to a 3D object where you just take, instead of just taking two Fourier transforms of your function, you just take three tr Fourier transforms. So they just take one after the other after the other. So this leads us to what's called the Fourier slice theory. And so a projection of an object is equivalent to a central slice of that object's Fourier transform at the viewing angle. So if we have this object, we, can ha we have some sort of Fourier transform of that object. But if we don't actually know what this object is, then we have to start building up what the information of this object is. So if we take a projection of this object, we get this function. We're taking a 2D object and decompose and, and um, lowering its dimensionality to 1 so we take this projection, and so this projection then, if we take the Fourier transform of this object, it actually turns into a slice of the, three, of, the four, uh, of the Fourier transform of this object at that angle theta. So this slice would be here, and if we project it in this direction instead, the slice would be here at the other angle. Okay, so as we tilt, rotate this object, we can see that the, the angle where we're actually sampling, sampling the information changes. So if we look a little bit deeper into this, I just told you that, but how does this actually work? If we look at a 2D for, the 2D Fourier slice theorem, we have our mass density of our object. And if we look at the formalism of the Fourier transform, you're integrating over this object with the operator of the Fourier transform to turn it into spatial coordinates. So here we have our object, and we can take a projection of that object, which is just an integration of that object along the projection direction. So let's just call that dz, the, the, the projection direction. Now, if we set, if we, if we have a projection along this direction, we've actually taken out all of the Fourier transform information, all the information along the z direction. So let's k, set kz equal to zero in our Fourier transform. Now we can decompose this because we no longer have any z in, the, in this operator. We can now just separate out this, this integration over dz and bring that inside. So we can take this dz and put it inside here. And now this just becomes its own integration. We don't have to worry about anything outside of it. And what this looks like a lot is that this looks a lot like this. So the Fourier transform of our projection is equivalent to the Fourier transform, uh, to the two-dimensional Fourier transform if we set all the uh, z components to zero. So that means that this, that's where this slice comes from. So this is the, for, the, the Fourier slice theorem. This is just, just how it breaks down. Okay, so what we really want to do is, a, is acquire as many projections of the object as possible so that we can sample its, its Fourier transform along many different directions. And then we build up what the Fourier transform of this object is, and there, we then have the possibility to just invert this Fourier space to get our three-dimensional or, or two-dimensional or three-dimensional object right back. Okay, so each projection gives us a little bit more information about the object, and once we add all those together in the right way, then we can just have a representation of our object, which we, we can possibly just inverse Fourier transform. OK, so what's really going on is here we have this object. It's just a square. And if I project that object, its density, we can see that we get 0 where there is no object and 250 because this is 256 pixels thick. And if we rotate that object, then we get different information about the object along different directions. 
And so each one of these rotations, if we take the Fourier transform, that gives us different information along different directions. So we're trying to fill in Fourier space. And this is just a really good way to think about how is tomography actually working? How, is, how do all these projections actually give me the object in the end? So these are all central sections through the Fourier space. OK, so I keep talking about real space and reciprocal space. And th this is a really important concept, one of the most important concepts you can think of in TEM, for sure, and in physics in general. Um, that is very critical to, understand, uh, to understanding this. And it's commonly referred to as Fourier, reciprocal, and maybe frequency space. All three of these things mean the same thing in general. So you take the Fourier transform, and it deconstructs a real space object into its spatial frequencies. Okay, So it turns it into sine and cosine components. And by looking at, by plotting that, or by looking at a two-dimensional representation, which you use very commonly in the TEM, you just press the FFT button now, because computers are so fast, and you just get an FFT. So the real space and the FFT space can show you very different things and give you an idea of where the information is that you're getting from the object. Okay? One key distinction between real and reciprocal space is that extended objects in real space will look like compressed objects in reciprocal space, and the opposite. If it's compressed in real space, then it will be very extended in reciprocal space. Okay? That's something just to, to remember and just to think about. So if we look at a high-resolution image of graphene, so each one of these, these dots here is a single atom of carbon, one of the black dots, and then in the center here, there's nothing. So this was taken just in a, a high-resolution aberration-corrected electron microscope. And here we can see a Fourier transform of this image. So here is the zero frequency, and then each one of these spots indicates the lattice parameters of this object. Okay? So at low frequency here, that means those are objects that are large. So that's information about the object that extends over the whole image. And as we go to higher and higher frequency, we go to smaller and smaller spacing. So these inner angles is the difference between this left atom here and this left atom here. So each dumbbell has its own frequency. And then just and the frequency in between each dumbbell also is then the next level out. So as we go higher and higher and higher, that means that things have to be closer and closer and closer together. Okay. Now, if we take a Fourier transform of a two-layer of graphene, then we can see that we get this really crazy pattern, right? And now this is really difficult to interpret. We just have two layers of graphene, and they're rotated. So this doesn't look like graphene anymore. We don't see those, those dumbbells, and this is really hard to tell where are the atoms and where aren't the atoms. So you wouldn't be able to tell maybe what the structure is. But if we take the Fourier transform of this object, we can now see that we have two spots where we used to have one. So we can tell definitely from here that this is just two layers of graphene, just rotated with respect to each other. So that's what I mean by if you look at the real space interpretation and the Fourier space interpretation, you can get very, you can get some information from one and you can get more information or uh, different information from the other that you might not al al already be able to have. Okay? So here we can see that um, we have two, two layers of graphene and we can actually, I can actually tell you what the ro rotation of that is. It's less than five degrees. It's, a li it's not that much. It's actually, well, it's about, th it's 13.7 degrees. So you can tell that from the Fourier transform. So really, our objects, any object, you can Fourier transform any object. You have your own Fourier transform, if you want to look at that. So this is, I was putting together my lecture, and this is a picture of my dog. She was, she wanted to play, but I had to work. <laughs> so this is the Fourier transform of my dog, of this image, actually. So you can see where the information is. Maybe this doesn't tell you that this is a dog. But it at least tells you a little bit about the, about the object, maybe about the camera that was used to take it. But there's, there's more here than you, you might think would be really available. OK? So really, each image, we're, take, we're, just, we're taking images, right? And you might want to think about them that they just are images. But really, what you want to think about is that this is just made up of a discrete set of pixels or measurements of your object, OK? So if we, if we zoom up really high and we can see the individual pixels of this image, or if we see the individual pixels of this image, they don't really look that much different. Right? So these really are just data sets. They're sets of intensities with x, y positions. So really what you want to think about is instead of looking at objects or looking at TEM images or looking at other things as images, they're really data sets. And then you can really start thinking about what are the types of algorithms or ma mathematical manipulations that I can start using to get more information out of, this, out of these different objects? So that's really um, how electron tomography really can give you a lot of information about your object. It's not just a picture of things anymore. It's now really a, a, a data set that you can manipulate and you can look at in all kinds of different ways. Okay.
So now that we kind of understand how electron tomography can work, how, let, let's look at actually the, the scanning transmission electron microscope, or the TEM also, as a structure projector. So I've, I've assumed throughout all of this that the images that we're getting are actual projections of our, of our, our, of our object. But is that really true? And in what cases on, in, in the TEM is that not really true? So in TEM and STEM, if people are not uh, uh, familiar, some people in material science, I only worked with STEM when I was a graduate student. We did almost no TEM. And then biologists would do almost no STEM, and they would do a lot of TEM, or the other way around. So in TEM, or converge, uh, uh, um, normal uh, TEM, you have a source, and you have an illumination lens, and you make a very parallel beam of electrons. So you take an image of, you, you illuminate the object all at once. You take uh, electrons, and they hit all over the sample. And then you use your lens, and you take a pixelated detector on the other side, something that's very similar to what you have in, in cell phone cameras or cameras all over the world, just a little bit um, much more advanced. Um, so you're actually taking a pixelated detector and then creating one image. It takes like one second, and you've got your image. You're done. Now in STEM, we take our source, and we use our illumination optics to actually converge the beam onto the sample. So we only illuminate a really tiny point, like an angstrom, 0.1 nanometers wide. And then we raster this across the sample. And at each different raster position, we use a detector, like a solid annular detector, which is just a donut. It's just round, and it has a hole in the middle. So that the highly scattered electrons will hit the detector. And the, the, the electrons that go straight through and, this, and the diffracted electrons, which are usually forward scattered, go straight through the detector so they don't hit. So we're only looking at the electrons that are scattered to very high angles. And that means that we only get incoherent imaging. So most of the electrons that are scattered to very high angles are actually scattered by phonons, or the, the wiggle of the, of the atoms. And so that gives them this really large scattering out here. And that's incoherent. So there's no phase to that. They have, they have lost their phase information. Here in TEM, we have phase information, which can be very useful. But it also can be very not useful if we're doing tomography, because we're going to start tilting something. And if you have diffraction, then you can start getting uh, crystals that will go from white to black to white to black as you rotate. And that is, not, uh, that is not good for tomography, because that's not a monotonic function. So with STEM, we can get mono, a monotonic function that depends on the thickness of the object here. OK? So STEM is kind of relatively complex technology. You really have to have a really stable microscope. You have to be able to focus this down very, very precisely. Um, it also takes a really long time to take an image, uh, upwards of 30 seconds. So that's not great. It's also very sensitive to focus. If you uh, move the focus out by 10 nanometers or something, your object is completely blurred, and you don't get as crisp of an image as you want. Um, you also get a real problem called contamination, where the beam actually uh, deposits, uh, deposits carbon on the sample as you take the image. And that's the killer of almost all STEM experiments. Um, what's really great about it is it's an incoherent imaging method. It's high contrast, especially for heavy materials, which is great. Material scientists, we have a lot of metals and things like that, which scatter very highly. And then there's not really a defocus problem, where if you're in focus here, then the whole object will pretty much be in focus, which is great. But in TEM, it's a common parallel illumination. It's single shot imaging. You take one second, you have your image, you're good to go. Um, and it's pretty much insensitive to defocus. Uh, if you're defocused by a very large amount, which you typically, typically do in um, TEM imaging, uh, for tomography especially. Um, you get complex phase information in the transfer function, which we heard about a little bit earlier. Um, and that can be bad for, especially for material scientists. It's very low contrast, so you have to go to very large defocus. Um, and then you, if you start rotating your sample, then you can get a defocus change across the field of view. So this object will be up here, and this part will be down here, and then you'll get a different contrast transfer function across the whole object. So that can be also a problem. But generally, STEM is good for hard materials, and this is what I'm mainly going to talk about, as I said. So one of the things that we have to think about in STEM is that the depth of focus of our, of our object. And so for an uncorrected electron microscope, um, our, our, our sample, uh, the, the depth of focus of this is around 50 nanometers, something like that, depending on the settings of your microscope. But it's a good kind of rule of thumb. And the full sample thickness may not be in focus if it's 50 to 100 nanometers thick. So this violates the projection requirement, because the top will be out of focus, the bottom will be out of focus, or it depends on where you set the focus. And you might want to think that if we go to an aberration corrector, then we can actually improve the resolution much better. 
but you improve, improve the resolution not only laterally, but you improve it in, in Z depth as well. So here we, can, uh, here we can see that this is now out of focus. And so if we have a, a short depth of focus and your object is really large, then we get uh, an out of focus image of the bottom of the sample and not of the top of the sample. So it's no longer a perfect projection. And as I said, in, in um, an ab aberration corrected microscope, you might think, oh, we can go just aberration corrected and then we can get higher resolution information of our object and just get higher resolution reconstructions. That's not really true because here's an uncorrected stem. This is the depth of focus here. It's around 33 nanometers for these settings. But if we go to an aberration corrected stem with similar settings, uh, we actually get a much shorter depth of field. So now, our, our, an object might have been fully in focus out to one nanometer or something um, in this direction uh, uh, through 200 nanometers. But here, now, our object is going to be only in focus for about six nanometers. And the rest of it is going to be defocused. So we have to, you have to be a little careful if you're thinking about aberration correction is going to give me a higher resolution image or a higher resolution tomogram. Um, so, with the stem depth of focus, if we have our object and we tilt to very high angles, we can see that if this was our original stem depth of focus, if this was at zero degrees, the whole thing would be in focus and we'd be good. But if we tilt to very high angles, then this can be blurred, this will be sharp, and then this will be blurred as well. So we have to think about that. Um, so what we can do, though, is we can start... Uh, so this is what's happening here. So this is out of focus, this is out of focus, and then all of this is in focus. So now these objects will not be faithfully reconstructed because they're, they're out of focus comparatively. But if we use what's called stem dynamic focusing, where you can actually change the focus of the object as you scan the beam across, you can keep the entire object in focus all the way across the object. So that's really nice. Dynamic focusing keeps the entire field of view in focus. So this is something very good for large field of view objects um, for stem. And so here's an example of that. If we look at zero degrees, the whole object is in focus. If we look at 50 degrees, we can see this starts getting blurred on the top and bottom. Only the center really is in focus. But if we use dynamic focusing, we can see that we can keep the whole thing in focus all the way across the object. So we also get another problem, is that the sample thickness increases as you tilt it up to high angles. And so here we have our sample, which is a slab sample, and we have a thickness t. But if we tilt it up to a high angle, we can see that the, the projected thickness of the object now is, is much different. Okay. And so the thickness of this object goes as t over the cosine of theta. So as you get to higher and higher angles, it gets more and more, it gets thicker and thicker. So that means that your resolution will go down, things won't be in focus, all kinds of things like that. So as you get out to about 70 degrees, this is why people typically stop at about 70 degrees, maybe 80, because your object is now getting so thick, it's about three times thicker, that you don't really get good images anymore. So it's not really worth going to that. And in the worst case, we can't tilt the object all the way to 90 degrees. So that means that we're going to be missing some information at the very high angles. So the highest angle that we can get to, depending on the thickness and the, and, and the field of view and uh, the, the part, the, the stem depth of focus, that will really determine maybe how high you can get in, in, in the sample, uh, how high of a tilt you can get. So although you, most, most uh, tomography samples that you look at are going to be slabs like this, you can also make some needle-shaped samples where it'll be the same thickness no matter what you do, but those are very difficult to make. Um, and then there's also hardware geometry, the sample holder, the goniometer limits, and then grid shadowing also is going gonna, is gonna to end it, uh, anyway. So getting up to 90 degrees is really hard. So uh, those are just some things to think about with STEM imaging and some of the problems that you might run into, some of the limitations you might want to think about. But now what we get to is tomographic reconstruction. So we have, our ob we have our tilt series of our object. And so now, how do we get this really beautiful image or a three-dimensional model of some sort of object that we really want to look at so it looks pretty and we get a paper and everything? But really, just going from this to this, there's a lot hidden back here that a lot of people don't show you, that don't tell you about. So let's look at what's happening in between the pretty model and just getting the data. So here we have an unaligned. So this is a tilt series of that same object. In the beginning half, it's unaligned. And then the second half, it's aligned. So how do we go from that, that object that is moving around all over the place to an object that is actually aligned so that we can get all the information about the object so it projects, so the computer knows where the object is in every single tilt angle? Because if it's, it's all over the place like this, you're not going to get any kind of good reconstruction. So a lot of people use cross-correlation. You use marker particles. You can use manual alignment. There's all kinds of different ways to go over that. And I could give a whole lecture on, on that entire thing. 
but we only have a certain amount of time. So I'll just go over some of the alignment strategies that people can use. So you can use cross-correlation, which actually you can take the Fourier transform. You can use the Fourier transform of two different objects to figure out what the, the, the shift is in those two different objects. And so it's very simple to implement, and it's very rapid computation. You can do Fourier transforms and, and do that kind of stuff very quickly. Um, you can improve it with filtering and by scaling the objects by 1 over cosine, but it can very easily fail for complex objects, even for simple objects. I've, I've seen it just wildly fail a lot. So if you're just going to use cross-correlation, you have to be really, really careful. And you have to be able to look at your, re at your object and, and know that it looks like it's tilted and that it's, uh, it looks like it's, like it's all aligned to the same object. Um, it only really works for lateral uh, alignment. And then it rarely works for down to one pixel ac ac accuracy alignment. So it's usually much worse than, than one pixel accuracy. So now what a lot of people have done, especially for biomaterials, things like that, you go to fiducial particles. So you have your object in the center here, and you use these tiny dots. So these are five nanometer gold particles that you sprinkle across your sample. And then you use those as a reference, because they're round, approximately. And then that means that they will, they will just um, look the same at every single tilt angle, and the computer will find that object and just compute what your alignment should be. So it knows that this object is here, and this object is here, and it can figure out how they rotate around each other. So you can get sub-pixel accuracy alignment, and you can also get the rotation uh, axis of this. So whether it rotated about this angle or this axis, it can figure that out. Um, it's available in very mature software, such as the iMod program, which you can download. Um, it gets you lateral magnification, rotation, precession, mass loss, all kinds of different things you can apply to this. The only problem is it's very it can be very time consuming in practice, especially compared to just pressing go and letting it do a cross correlation. Um, it's got a steep learning curve, I've noticed. It took me a while even to figure this out, and I've tried to teach people how to do it, and there are lots of hang-ups. Especially for stem tomography data, the iMod program is uh, not set up. You have to know where to check a few boxes to really get that to work. And then it's really optimal only for low magnifications. So if we think of these are 5 nanometer gold particles. So if we want to go up to something that's 10 nanometers or 20 nanometers across, the, now the fiducial particles actually become the size of our sample. And so now maybe an atom might be what you'd have to use as a fiducial particle. But those move around all. Those can move around if they're not in a, in a crystal. So now this, this is only really going to work for low magnification objects. So let's, once. Uh, once we can figure out how to get the alignment done, um, then we can go on to actually how the, the reconstruction is implemented. So if we have our tilt series of objects, and now we're going to assume that we went through all the alignment steps, which, I could, as I said, I could give a whole s lecture on that. Um, and so it requires these three things, which I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. And so in 3D Fourier information sampling, as I said, in a lot of cases, you can't tilt your object all the way up to plus or minus 90 degrees. You can only get it up to maybe 70 degrees. So we have this missing wedge of information, kind of the infamous missing wedge of information, um, which you'll hear about a lot in electron tomography. And this gives you artifacts um, and resolution re reduction. So we have missing information here, but we also have missing information in between these different wedges that we're t uh, in, in between these different slices in Fourier space that we're looking at, OK? So that means that we're really only filling in information, not out to the resolution of the image that we might have gotten, but only out to a certain point where the distance between these is now too large, that we're not really filling in that information anymore. So we get artifacts and resolution reduction along the y direction and along the direction uh, 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 perpendicular to the tilt axis, the y direction, um, due to this missing information. So we don't get a perfect reconstruction. So if we look at just this 2D Fourier transform where the missing information is, we also have missing information here in 3D. So if we look at this model of what the filling of Fourier space is in, in three dimensions, we can see that we actually have a whole wedge that's missing along the entire tilt axis of the object. So you can get kind of a tomography resolution estimation. This is very uh, hand wavy a little bit uh, because your alignment your original resolution of your object, of your original images, uh, the alignment, the, the thickness of the object, all kinds of different things will change your resolution. So this is kind of a best case scenario if your projections were perfect and your alignment was perfect. So this is kind of the best you could, you could think about achieving. And so the resolution along the y direction, perpendicular to the tilt axis, is limited by this filling of Fourier space we get from these slices. So as, as we go to higher and higher frequencies, or smaller and smaller spatial 
uh, distances, we see that this, these slices get further and further apart, and at some point you kind of consider that they're no longer filling in Fourier space. So you can kind of assume that. Uh, you can kind of figure that out by using the diameter of your object, which is the highest spatial frequency out here, and then the number of discrete sampling positions using a uh, uh, angular increments of, of single steps in between each one of these. So this gives you a, an estimate of the resolution along the y direction. It gets a lot worse, though, because along the z direction, which is our original projection direction, which is where our missing wedge of information is, it's much worse by this so-called elongation factor. And so this elongation factor is called EZY, and you can kind of figure out what that is um, based on what the highest tilt angle, alpha, is in your object. So if you put in 70 degrees here, you get an elongation factor that can be pretty big. Um, and so your elongation factor is about 1.3, so it's about 30% longer because you have no information about how the, where the uh, intensity of the object is along the projection direction. So that gives you an uncertainty in that, and that's about 30%. <laughs> so a lot of objects will be elongated along that direction. It won't really look right. And so your z-axis, which unfortunately is the information that you really wanted. You started doing tomography because you want to know what's the information along the projection direction. That's the worst resolution that you can get. So what you really have to do is get to the, a maximum tilt at least above 70 degrees, and higher is better. If you can get everything, then you can completely get rid of this um, problem but that's very impractical in most cases. And then in, um, this is all really for material science and this is just the reconstruction uh, uh, algorithm itself, but in um, a lot of cases such as uh, biology, the electron dose is what really limits the applications for sensitive materials. So it's signal to noise ratio that really matters. So this, the, this there's a whole other set of uh, equations and things that you can figure out for how electron dose can limit things. So now if we have our three-dimensional information we, that we filled in Fourier space, we've aligned everything, um, and we're ready to do the reconstruction, how do we get our object out? What's the algorithm, or what do we use between this to get our density distribution of our object? Okay? So can we just apply the inverse Fourier transform of our object, inverse Fourier transform of this, to get our three-dimensional object or two-dimensional object back? And that's... In practice, uh, in theory, you could do that for sure, but in practice, it doesn't work so well. So there's problems with direct Fourier transform inversion because what we acquire our information on is a radial uh, function, right? So we're taking angle and then distance from the center. That's where we really get our information. So you can think of these dots as uh, spatial frequencies that we're getting along each axis. But when you take a Fourier transform, a fast Fourier transform in the computer, it does it on a Cartesian coordinates. So what we're actually getting is this information here. We have to interpolate all of this information to fit it on this Cartesian axis. And in those interpolation values can actually, if you, if, if you use the wrong interpolation or if you change the interpolation slightly, you can get totally different answers in your reconstruction. So that's why um, using direct Fourier transform inversion is not really commonly done. There are some newer methods to solve this problem, and I'll talk about that at the end of my lecture. Um, but mostly people do not use this method at all. What we use instead is something called the radon transform. And so in the image domain, so it's something similar to the Fourier transform, but instead of going from um, real space to reciprocal space, we go into a radon space that's actually just projections of the object. So if you have your object and you take a projection along this line, so we sum the density of the object along this line. So we have some angle that this line is at, and we have some distance from the zero point that it's at. So we can set, uh, we can describe this object then in terms of its radon domain by figuring out that along this line, which is uh, at an angle of pi over two, uh, which doesn't match what I drew here, but whatever, um, we have one point here that gives us the summation of the object along, uh, the summation of the mass of that object along that point, and that gives us one single point in this plot. So now we can take lines at this angle and that will fill in every, all of the lines here and then we can do it at many different rows and we can fill in all the rows here. And that gives us what's called a sinogram. So this gives you the intensity or the density, the sum density of that object at every single point um, to the fidelity that we want where uh, we figure out how many thetas and how many rows that we want to do. Okay? So this avoids reciprocal space amplitude phase space, 
and it's a much simpler inter uh, interpolation. So you're interpol interpolating really in real space rather than in Fourier space. So it's much easier to do. So here, uh, we can go back to these three projections that I have. And if we look at the objects here, the, this, this would be uh, the sinogram of each one of these things. And we don't really have enough information to tell you what the, 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 the distribution of these objects is. So if we do what's called a tomography back projection, we can actually take these sinograms and we can back project or kind of figure out that along this line there should have been this sum of an object and along this line there should have been this sum of mass. And we can do this for each one of these different orientations. And we can see that if we do this for just these three lines, we can see that we don't get just the three ones that we, we know the object is made of. We actually get two spurious ones on the outside. Because where these things overlap, we might imagine that there are actually objects there from this back projection method. So what we really need is not only this low tilt information, we need to get to a very high tilt before we can tell that, oh, there's actually nothing there. So that's why we really need to get to these high tilts to do this. And that's how the back projection can actually give you the three-dimensional reconstruction of the object. So you need many more projections. This is just four projections. But in, if something is very complex and has a very complex shape, um, you need many more projections to, to get out what, the, uh, what that object actually looks like, more complicated objects. So if we look at our inverse radion transform, so we're going to find out if I ask on this plot what is the intensity of that object or the, the mass density of that object along a certain direction, tilt angle, and at a distance from the axis, I can actually tell from my sinogram what that actually is so I can get a number out from that. And then I can use that to do a back projection. Okay, so I'm going to show, this is a back projection here of just, the, of an object. I did uh, a reconstruction of an object, and I'm going to show you how that object actually builds up as we put different frequency information into it. So here, we just get this, this is the intensity of the object along just this, this direction. Okay, and so now as I fill this up, you can see that from the back projection, that's how the object fills in. Okay, so we ended up with a square. And now you can see that if you take a Fourier transform of this, we actually get this, this filling in a Fourier space that I theoretically told you existed. This is an actual Fourier transform of that object as I was doing the radon uh, transform. Okay? So this is from plus and minus 90 degrees, and it's 60 projections. And you can see we get some artifacts here. And that's because we have missing information in between the wedge, in between each tilt. But we have all the tilt along all the different directions, so you can really figure out that this was actually a square. Now, <clears throat> if we go to a limited tomography reconstruction, which is what almost always happens, we see that if we use the radon back projection on only plus and minus 70 degrees with 50 projections, so exactly the same angular increment between the objects, but we're now going to be missing information plus and minus 30 degrees here at the top. So if you look at how this fills in, we can actually see that we get these tails of the object here, and we can't fill in that last, that really high spatial frequency of, of that this is a square. So we can maybe infer that it is, but it's hard to tell. We have no information about where this intensity should really go. So we're missing this region of space, and that turns into these tails that you get on the outside. So if we compare our plus and minus 90 degree to our plus and minus 70 degree, we can see what kind of artifacts we get from doing this kind of reconstruction. So that was just a normal uh, back projection. There was no filtering. There was nothing put into that. That was a very simple uh, model. So we can get a little more complicated by using what's called the weighted back projection. So if we look here in our Fourier transform uh, of how uh, we're filling in information space, each one of these dots represents a frequency that we actually measured along here. And we can see that those are pretty um, even, evenly spaced. And that means that at very low frequencies or large spatial frequencies, we get a lot of dots. We get a lot of information. At the high spatial frequencies, we don't get that much information because these are much further apart, right? So here, we have a very dense information. And then out, we have very low information. So what you really need to do is you need to weight this by the number of pixels that you have in the center versus the number of pixels that you have on the outside. And that just is simply you weight by a function that darkens or lessens the amount of intensity you have here. And it, it goes as uh, r, the distance from the center, all the way out. And so that's what's called a weighted back projection. <clears throat> so the low frequency are, are oversampled. So that's what we call it. The high frequency are undersampled. 
So we need to apply this R weighting filter in Fourier space after we do the back projections. And that will give us a much better interpretation of what the object is. So here, this is uh, called the phantom. A lot of people use this to figure out how do their reconstruction methods or things work on this kind of object, because it has lots of different intensities, values, things uh, in a lot of different positions. So here's the original density, mass density map, OK? If we look at an unfiltered back projection, <clears throat> we can see that we don't have these high spatial frequencies showing up. They're really hard to see. You probably can't even see them in this. And that's because the low frequencies are dominating. So it's really blurry. And you have a lot of information about things that are big, but not a lot of information about things that are small or close together. But if we use the weighting function, we can actually get a very nice representation of our object back out. So this, I applied, this is the exact same reconstruction. I just applied the weighting filter to it. And so that actually puts all the frequencies in the right places with the right weightings. And you get a really nice reconstruction. And this is a plus and minus 90 degree rotation. So I have all the information in this. And it's really small spacing, because I did it in a computer. So I didn't have to actually take the data. So this filter produces a, a nice, faithful reconstruction of the object. Now, uh, we can still get uh, uh, artifacts in this. So if we look at a filtered back projection from plus and minus 70 degrees, we can see that we start losing a lot of information in the object. So this is due to the missing wedge, mainly. So here we get these tails on the top and bottom. And here I, can, I blew this up a little bit so you can actually see that. And so this missing information introduces artifacts that were not seen in the original projections. So if we were to reproject this, we would see these tails, meaning if we, in the computer, if we were to just sum this object along many different angles, which we can do very easily, we, we would actually see these tails, which would not match our original projections. So these would be artifacts that we know really exist. So we can use our original projections as a reference. And we can, we can match these projections, these reprojections of our three-dimensional object to our original projections. And then we can do what's called an iterative process to remove those artifacts. So here we have our original tilt series. We get an object that we reconstruct. So we take this object and we reconstruct it in the computer to give us a new set of, tilt, uh, of, of data. So these are now angles, uh, 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 simulated uh, projections of our object. And then we can compare those through division or multiplication or all kinds of different things to our original projections. And we can do this multiple, multiple times. So we can remove artifacts using this kind of iterative process. And so here's what that looks like. So normally, you'd stop here. You get your 3D reconstruction, and that'd be done. You filter it, and you're done. But here, we can actually project this 3D reconstruction. We can take these reprojections and divide them and go through all these different steps in an iterative loop for n number of times. And once we get to the end, when, when the object either doesn't change anymore or that we just say, I'm tired of letting the computer work on this, we get our final reconstruction out. OK? So this is what this is actually going to look like. So this is our original unfiltered data. And you can see some of the, there's missing information here. And we have none of the low frequency, we have the high frequency information isn't really there. So I'm going to take it through, this is, we're right at this point of this image. So there's zero iterations here. And now I'm going to go through 20 iterations of what's called the simultaneous iterative reconstruction technique, which is this division where you go through these kind of things. So as we go through this, you can see that the object becomes closer and closer and closer, and we get this high frequency information. It gets closer and closer and closer to what the actual object originally looked like. So this is at each one of these iterations, we can see that the object gets closer and closer. We get more and more frequencies and uh, a better match to our original projections. OK? So that's, a recon so that's pretty much reconstruction, how you re reconstruct things. Um, so in review, back projection is really a real space operation. OK? Uh, it's much simpler to interpolate on our sinograms uh, rather than going into Fourier space. So we can get kind of an easier reconstruction method, and it works better. Weighted back projection uses an R weighting in Fourier space to produce the correct weighting of Fourier filters of Fourier uh, objects from the center to the outside. And then you can use also iterative techniques that compare each reconstruction, a series of reconstructions, against your original perfect projections to get rid of some of those artifacts. Okay? And then I'll talk more on advanced Fourier algorithms later that uh, people are using now to get down to atomic resolution and to improve things. As computers get, get faster and faster and we get new algorithms, we can actually start looking at um, direct uh, interpretation. So 
Now, I've talked about these tomography artifacts, and these were from perfectly aligned, uh, no problems in the reconstruction, no problems in the projections, things like that. But what are the artifacts that we can expect uh, if we have an object that we have no idea what it should look like? And what about the quality of the alignment of the tilt series? And it's really sometimes difficult to de determine the quality of the al that alignment or even quantify it at all. So you have really no idea, other than looking at the reconstruction, uh, for, uh, looking at artifacts in the reconstruction, what your original data, how well aligned you did before you put it in the, the reconstruction uh, algorithm. So cross-correlation can produce a lot of different errors, and I'll go through a, a few of those. You get really large jumps. Sometimes it gets confused and it, and it makes a large jump between objects. And you can also get very small, consistent shifts of one or two pixels per image that lar end up at a very large shift at the end of your object, uh, at the end of your reconstruction. And it's actually really hard to see this if, if you haven't done it quite a lot. So these artifacts are really clear when you know what you want to look for. So this is one way that you can um, subjectively, at least, look at what the, how, the, how good the alignment is and how much you can believe your object. So the first thing to really look at is the missing wedge effect. Okay? So if we have some round object, like a gold nanoparticle, something like that, and we look at it as we start taking more and more data out, so this is the maximum tilt angle that we got to, so we go from 90 down to 40 degrees, we can see that we get a really nice reconstruction of our round object here, but as we get further and further, it gets more and more extended along the original projection direction. So it gets worse and worse. So around 70 degrees seems to be a pretty good place where you can get these round objects actually give you a good reconstruction. But then you can start seeing the flattening off of this, and then it starts extending worse and worse. So these high tilts are really necessary for a faithful reconstruction of your object. OK? So one of the things that I do a lot is we look at a lot of nanoparticles, because they're really small. And one of the interesting things that a lot of people want to look at are the facets on these nanoparticles. So what happens when we try to reconstruct one of these objects um, uh, as we're projecting along this vertical axis? What actually happens to the reconstruction? So if I look at this object, I just take, uh, uh, this is just a, a reconstruction. And I just want to measure how thick is this object compared to this compared to this. So we can see that in this reconstruction, I can get that the, the thickness of the shell of this core shell nanoparticle is some value, um, whatever pixels this is. Um, and the vertical direction is the original projection direction. So now if we look, uh, this was the model that I was looking at, sorry, in red. So this is the original data. And if we look at the reconstruction of the object, doing plus or minus 70 degrees, we can see that, as we saw before, we get blurring of the object along this original direction. But along this direction, we actually have a lot of information, because this is perpendicular to the tilt axis along the original direction. So we can actually get an, a really good idea of what the thickness of that is, but still it's a little bit blurred out because we, have, we don't have infinite number of tilt angles. Okay. Now, what we really want to look at is what's the missing wedge going to do this, so along this direction. And this is a particle, and I'm just assuming that it's sitting flat on the substrate. So its facet is along the projection direction. But what if we looked at different nanoparticles, because they can be oriented on our object along the original projection direction, along any orientation that, that they want to. Right? So we can look at from 0 degrees to 15 degrees to 30 degrees to 45 degrees. Okay? And then I'm going to always be projecting along this axis. So we can see that this facet is going to be at a different angle with respect to the original projection direction. So more or less of this facet's information is going to be in the missing wedge. So if we look at our original uh, reconstruction plus or minus 70 degrees um, with the facet perfectly uh, showing to the, to the beam, then we get this missing information that really affects the structure of our particle. But if we start tilting it, we can see that now we see this facet a little bit better. And if we go to 35 degrees and then up to 45 degrees, we can actually see that we get actually a pretty good reconstruction of what this object looks like. Because most of the information of the facets is now contained within, uh, with, within the information that we have, not within the missing wedge. So even if we had all these nanoparticles strewn across a field of view, and we were trying to reconstruct 10 of them or something, depending on which way they were oriented, we'd have a different idea of what those structures might actually look like. So you have to be really careful about how you interpret these reconstructions based on where the information is, where you're getting it from. Okay? So now if I take, since I have the three-dimensional reconstruction of this, I can take a um, line uh, intensity plot through this object along any direction that I want. So I can figure out what the thickness of this is 
of this core shell, even though it's rotated 45 degrees with the, with the original direction. Right? So if I look at that, I can see that for the zero degree one, I just get a blur. I can't tell that there's really a core shell here where the, where the thickness, uh, where, one core en where the core ends and where the shell begins. But if we look at this one at 45 degrees, I can start getting an idea that this is actually a core shell particle. OK? So this 45 degree rotated object with this kind of structure gives a really good result, gives a pretty good result, but this gives a terrible result. So it's not only your reconstruction that you have to worry about, it's also the orientation and the, uh, of your objects and the information that you want to get out of them. So you have to be careful about that. So this is actually, I didn't just come up with this out of nowhere, this is actually an experimental 3D reconstruction of an object of these core shell nanoparticles. This is a platinum palladium core shell nanoparticle that I did a reconstruction of. It's about uh, 30 nanometers across, and we really wanted to know what the thickness of this was. And if we look at this as a reconstruction of one of them about 45 degrees with respect to the axis, I had ones that were also zero degrees, and they look very similar to the other one. But this, our experimental and our simulated image look very similar. They're quite good. So you can get a lot of information about these kind of objects. But that's just one, that's just a cube. That's just a square. Like, let's look at something that's round so we can figure out what happens at each, so this basically just has facets everywhere, these kind of round particles. And I'm going to put them in different positions inside this three-dimensional cube. And then I take a projection of this object, and I'm going to rotate it around this axis along this direction. So we can see that we have uh, objects in different corners and one in the very center, which I'm going to rotate around the center of this object. Okay? Nine, sphere, nine spheres in a body-centered cubic. So this is what a tilt, axis, a tilt, uh, tilt series of that kind of object would look like. Okay, 70 images plus minus 70 degrees with two degree tilt steps. And so if we sum all of these projections, we can see that this, we can see where the tilt axis was. We can see that these objects rotated about a tilt axis that was uh, perpendicular to this. This object didn't move, so we kind of know where the center of the of tilt is, all kinds of things like that. So just taking your tilt series that you've already aligned and taking a sum of that can actually give you kind of a lot of information about what was going on and how well aligned it is a little bit. OK? So one thing to really remember about tomography, I've been kind of going between two dimensions and three dimensions when we're doing the reconstruction. Basically, since we have just one tilt axis, our object tilts around that. And so any intensity from this object never interacts with any intensity from this object. Same thing with this object. So only things perpendicular to the tilt axis interact with each other and overlap. So you can decompose this three-dimensional tilt, tilt object into just two-dimensional slices. So when you do the reconstruction, you do a reconstruction on just this slice, and you add it to your 3D volume. Then you do a reconstruction just on this slice and this slice, and you build it up from left to right. So any information here doesn't interact with any information here. And that's why getting this tilt axis correct is very important, because if we were actually to reconstruct along this angle, then hypothetically, this object would be interacting with this object. But that's not what really actually happened. So that's why getting this tilting axis is very important. And then this is also really interesting because it's highly parallelizable. You could technically, if you had a uh, uh, computer with 100 cores, you could reconstruct 100 of these at the same time because they're all independent. What we really then can look at also are the, what are called the tilt series sinograms. So along this direction, I'm going to say this is the theta. So each one of these slices along that direction is a different image of the object at a different theta. We have um, the distance from the tilt axis along this direction and then just uh, uh, the distance along the tilt axis here. So in a sinogram, we can look at all these different images. But if we actually look at along the tilt axis, we can get what's called, what this is actually what the sinogram is. So we can see where the object was at each single tilt axis, at, si at each single tilt direction. And we can get an idea of how these objects are moving as we're tilting them. OK? So these sinograms are really, really useful if you, if you look at your tilt series and you try to, try to look at how these are, um, how, how this looks. You can actually get a lot of information about how your alignment of your, tilt, uh, of your tilt series is. So we look at the sinograms. We can look at three different areas. We can look at these objects. They're far from the tilt axis, so they're going to follow a sine curve, a sinogram, a sine curve. So they tilt around the center, and they rotate like this. And so you can see different ones are in different quadrants, so they rotate differently. The one in the center is right on the tilt axis, so it just rotates, and it doesn't move at all. Okay. So what happens if we misalign our tilt series, which almost always is the case? 
So I'm going to misalign this with a normal distribution of misalignments, RMS1 and a mean of 0 0.676. So this is in pixels. So I get 0 pixel shift, 1 pixel shift, 2 pixel shift, 3 pixel shift. So some of them are going to be better aligned than others. And what this looks like is your object kind of wiggles around. right? And so this is kind of uh, a good estimation of how you might actually align a tilt series, what your actual object may look like. And if we look at the sinograms of this misaligned tilt series, we can actually see that this no longer looks very smooth, right? It looks jagged. So if you have this kind of jagged information in your sinograms, that means that your misalignments are actually very apparent. And if you're talking about single one pixel or half a pixel or something like that, in if you're trying to look at the images, you have to look at all the images back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But in, if you just look at one sinogram, you can get an idea of how the object is aligned at every single angle. Okay, so we can look at this is now no longer smooth, and we can see that we have not a great alignment anymore. How does this actually affect the reconstruction? So a reconstruction of this tilt series, if it's perfectly aligned, we can see that we get these, since these are off the tilt axis, we get this kind of S shape a little bit, and this is just due to the missing wedge. Um, if it's misaligned, we can see that we get, it's, it's a lot worse, things start getting much blurred, much more blurred, and here we can get that these tails get worse and worse and worse as we misalign it more and more and more. This is with weighted back projection. So if we go to CERT, we can start getting a much better idea of how these artifacts are removed by the iterative process also. We can see that these are kind of cut off on the top. And as we get from perfectly aligned to worse aligned to even worse aligned, you see this object gets blurred more and more and more blurred. So that's what really happens. So what happens if we have a kink in our spatial alignment? So at one point, I shifted the whole series on one side versus the other side. And this is really common that at zero degrees or near zero degrees, sometimes your, your, um, your, your alignment algorithm will lose the, lose the difference between the top, of the, uh, of the, uh, the top of the sample and the bottom, and it will start aligning from one to the other. So things can get really lost really quickly. OK? So here you can see you get these crazy, this, our round particles really no longer are round. They have all kinds of different artifacts and weird things in them. Okay. So even the one in the center looks really kind of oblong and weird and has all these different shapes coming off of it. OK? So what if we have a drift in our alignment? So we're going to go from this is going to drift a little bit by like one pixel misalignment every three images. So that's not actually that. That's not too bad. And it can be actually hard to see something like this when you have not a, a really simple object like this, but something much more complex. So here if we see this is misaligned, so this goes from the bottom to the top. We can see that in the sinograms, although th we're lucky here that we know what the object should look like. So you can't really look at this and say that this is misaligned like that, because this is a, just a very simple object. So these are a little bit misleading that maybe you could tell what was going on. But maybe the object actually looks like this, so it may sh should be like that. Okay. But what happens to drift is that you get these tails that look a lot worse. So you start getting tails that are perpendicular to the original tilt axis, and they start getting much, much worse. And we get um, some tails on the bottom here. Okay. If we have a perfect tilt axis alignment, as I said, we're rotating about this, this line here. And you can see that this object doesn't move, and these ones that are far from the tilt axis actually move. But what happens, uh, OK, uh, this is a reconstruction of that object without any weighting or anything like that to highlight these tails here. So this is where the missing information is. And we can see that they're equivalent on both sides. OK. But our most back projection algorithms assume that the tilt axis is horizontal, maybe vertical, maybe horizontal, either in the x or y direction, and that it's centered. Okay, So it runs through this part of your image. Not here, not here, different ways. Okay, But if I tilted around this axis and I told the algorithm that this is the axis that I tilted around, then I'm going to get a pretty bad reconstruction. Okay, But this is really uh, exaggerated. You might have maybe two pixels, three pixels, four pixels. It's very, it can be kind of difficult when you get down to nitty gritty, whether it's, it's two pixels up or three pixels down or various things like that. So what you actually get are these really large um, moon-shaped objects. And this is one of the most common things that I see in reconstructions that are done improperly. And this is highly exaggerated. But what you really want to do is you want the tails you can't get rid of, because that's from the missing information. But if you have tails only in one direction, then that means that your, your tilt axis is grossly misaligned. It's really bad.
So if you see tails in only one direction in all three images, then you know it's tilted positive. It's, it's shifted positive. And if it's negative, then if they tilted in the other direction, then it's negative. So if you shift that around a little bit, you can figure out where it goes from right pointing to left pointing to being perfectly off. So you really want to avoid these kind of tails that only go in one direction. So where's the origin of these crescent type artifacts is that um, you're basically rotating an object about a non-eucentric point. So the object rotates, so the object changes as it changes its position as it rotates about here. And so what we're really trying to do is just put this thing at eucentric height of the tilt series, and, ro and then it rotates perfectly, and then we can figure everything out. Okay? There's also the rotation of this. So if our original tilt axis was perfectly parallel, and we told it that the algorithm tilt axis was at this angle, okay? then what does our object look like? So here we get our object looks very, very nice in the center, because the center one uh, just reconstructs very nicely, and you don't have to really worry about the tilt that much. But the ones that are far from the center on either side actually have really bad artifacts in it. Okay? So you can't really just look at the center reconstruction. You can look at both sides also, give you an idea of what's going on. So for alignment and reconstruction, alignment is really the critical step to a successful reconstruction. You can get images on the microscope that they have automated, reconstruct they have automated acquisition programs that work very well nowadays. But the real problem is this alignment. In a lot of cases, it's a black box. You kind of put something in, you get something out. But you really have to be careful about what you're getting out of that before you put it in the reconstruction. Don't trust that black box. Make sure you look at it, OK? These small errors can significantly degrade your resulting 3D tomogram. And you get, with a much better alignment, you'll get much higher contrast in your final reconstruction. So you'll really be able to see the difference in a porous structure or the difference between a core shell structure, things like that, OK? And then a reconstruction with artifacts um, can be achieved regardless of the alignment quality. If you put the information into the algorithm, it just reconstructs it, and you can get whatever you think out of it. And always, a lot of people will show you the, the image along the original uh, uh, projection direction, and that will always look very pretty. <laughs> but you really want to see what does the 90 degree image look like. So this whole process is really difficult. It's pretty difficult and tedious, so expect that. But it's really the most common step to reduce large errors and poor, poor quality reconstruction. So it's really worth spending the time to get a really nice reconstruction. So that was a lot of theory. Um, I just thought I'd give you a couple examples of things that we do at NCEM um, with collaborative user projects at 3D Analysis. So I do a lot of work with users there. People send proposals to us, and then they come and use our microscopes to do tomography. So here, this is uh, an example of TEM used in um, material science. But these are these 5 nanometer gold nanoparticles that are suspended and uh, arranged by using a block copolymer. Okay? So you can see that you get this interesting structure. We have different patterns in different directions. Um, and we can get some hint that these things are actually um, have some sort of structure to them within the thickness of the sample. But from this two-dimensional projection, we have no idea what's going on. So instead, we did a three-dimensional reconstruction. You're going to see in this movie that we're going to slice through the thickness of the object. And we can see that we have alternating planes. We can also make a model of that. And we can tilt it along the original projection direction, so perpendicular to that. And we see that these objects actually create kind of a mesocrystal. So this isn't, these aren't atoms. These are 5 nanometer particles that are self-assembled using the block copolymer um, to make a, a very uh, a regular structure. So this can be really used for photonics, because now we're on the, the, the size that we can make regular things um, just by putting them in test tube and shaking them up and putting them in a thin film. Um, and they can start interacting with light. So we did that with um, nanoparticles and block copolymers. And we did that with nano, nano rods also by orienting the nano rods. I also have looked at porous structures. A lot of people have really started trying to do porous structures with 3D tomography. And so this is a, 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 a material where you have nickel hydroxide that decomposes into a porous nickel oxide. So the water leaves. And you end up with just nickel oxide that goes from a, a, a flake that has the same shape but no pores to this porous structure. So from a, just a two-dimensional image projection, we have an idea that it's porous. And we have an idea of what this, that there's a rim of more dense material here. We have no idea what the porosity of this actually is. And this is really important for, uh, this is an interesting material for um, um, batteries. B putting uh, lithium into and out of this material can be used. 
Okay? So if we look at a three-dimensional reconstruction of this, we can actually see that it's much more porous on the inside than it is on the outside, but we do have some pores around this rim, which you really would have no idea from just, just this single two-dimensional projection. And then we can also get, since we have the, not only the surface, but also the center of this object, we can measure what the porosity of the object is throughout its entire thickness. So we can get an idea that the porosity is actually larger on the top, on, on the top at the end of the flake near, uh, instead of near the bottom, and that can really give us an idea of how this pore structure actually um, was created. So um, we're talking about advanced electron tomography, so I had to do that at the end of this, after we went through all the theory. And so it's been really a grand challenge of electron microscopy to get the 3D atomic position of all the atoms. And this was really started by Richard Feynman in his famous lecture, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, where he says it would be very easy to make an analysis of any complicated chemical structure. All one would have to do would be to look at it and see where the atoms are. And this is where we're really trying to go. Because if you can see where the atoms are in the, in the material, you know a lot of its properties. You can figure out exactly how it's going to behave. Okay? And this occurred back in 1959, and people have been chasing this for a very long time. And I think with a lot of um, various um, advancements, we're getting very, very close to the, being able to do that. Uh, and so this grand material of material science would be able to image defects in the material, like dislocations, point defects, other things like that be able to image atomic species in 3D. So we look at dopant atoms, where the dopant atoms are located, and core shell kind of materials, what their interface is. And then ultimately, you'd want to look at amorphous materials, try to look at what the glass transition looks like or try to do that. And so um, I've been working with um, uh, John Miao, who works at UCLA, University of California at Los Angeles. And they've been, we've been publishing, uh, they've published a paper on platinum nanoparticle where they did a 3D reconstruction of at near atomic resolution of this object, and you can see defects and, and all kinds of things in this. And this is in Nature. They published it in 2013. And so we're trying to use, they used an, uh, a non-aberration corrected electron microscope for this. And so we're trying to, to transfer this up to NCEM, and we're doing this with an aberration corrected microscope to improve the resolution of this even further. So you're not able to really see where all the atoms are in the structure, but we can an idea of how the, de uh, w w how the defects are and where the, the um, different grains in the structure are. But going to aberration correction, we get much higher resolution, and we think we can actually, uh, we're getting really close to doing that. So what they're actually using is called an equally sloped tomography, uh, and they used an uncorrected stem. So these are single projection images of the object, of a gold object, and this is the 3D reconstruction of that. This was in their 2012 Nature paper. And you can see in every single image, you have lattice structure, and then if you take your three-dimensional reconstruction and you reproject that object, you can get really faithfully the same projection along that angle that you had in your 2D image. And what they're actually doing is they're getting around this problem that I told you that was if you take um, three-dimensional, if you take images uh, in a polar kind of coordinates, that interpolating between uh, polar, the, the real space and, and, and Fourier space can be really difficult. Okay? So what they're doing instead is instead of trying to figure out an interpolation method that works from reciprocal, from real space with polar coordinates to reciprocal space with Cartesian coordinates, they came up with the equally sloped tomography idea where you change the way that you actually take the data. So instead of taking data at, at equal angular increments, you actually take the data on a grid that is um, uh, with equal slope at each one, of the, each one of these tilt angles. And so that in... Um, in reciprocal space, the actual uh, information that you get matches the grid of what's called a pseudo-polar Fourier transform. So you can go from this information that is in Fourier space here right into real space Cartesian coordinate. So you can do um, direct Fourier uh, uh, inverse transform to get the object out. So what we're really using at uh, NSEM then is the team technology. So we have an XFEG in that that gets about 0 0.7 EV, and it can put uh, about we can put nanoamps of current into the beam, which is a lot. We have a monochromator that can go down to 0 0.1 EV. We have a probe corrector from CIOS that corrects for third and corrects for third and fifth order spherical aberrations. So not only it's not only CS anymore, C3 and C5, so the next order. We also have a very advanced team stage that's all piezo electric driven, and we can rotate it inside the microscope. We can completely flip the object inside the microscope. So with this aberration corrected microscope, we can look at things at low accelerating voltages. We can look at 80 keV. We can look at graphene. And this is an image of each atom in scanning transition electron microscope, uh, uh, each carbon atom in a graphene lattice. 
We can also go up to 300 keV and look at these gold nanoparticles. And if you look closely, you can see single atoms of gold on the carbon substrate. So getting much higher resolution, we go down to 0.5 angstrom resolution here and about 0.8 angstrom resolution uh, at uh, 80 keV. So we really can get single atom sensitivity for both high, heavy and light elements. And this is really important because um, what we've really seen that in going from 2D to 3D, no material is perfect. We're seeing um, all kinds of defects and grains and missing atoms and all kinds of things in almost any structure that we've looked at. So what we're really trying to do is eliminate these different uh, tomography limitations. The missing wedge of information, so we need to get up to plus or minus 90 degrees. And then we also want to get very high quality information. So we don't want this substrate to increase in thickness that reduces our signal to noise ratio. Because it turns out that the signal to noise ratio seems to be extremely important, especially at the high tilts, which is the information that we really need. We need really high quality information along this direction. So we've been going for the team, the team stage, where you can rotate the, the team stage inside the microscope to 90 degrees, so that we don't only look at the sample along this direction, we can look at it where we can rotate it this direction. And then we can actually rotate completely rotate the sample inside the microscope so we can do plus and minus 90 degree rotation. But what we need for this is a needle sample. So we need a sample here that doesn't have a substrate. So at every single tilt angle, it has the same basically projected thickness. This is all piezoelectric driven. It's got um, only like four moving parts instead of 20, 50, 100 that uh, normal goniometers have. So it's very simple. It, it rotates really highly and it's extremely stable, which is really great. So we also need to go to bottom up. We're trying to go to bottom up needle sample preparation. So we begin with a tungsten wire, and we're etching it in KOH. And we can get this kind of overall tip geometry, where we can get at the very, very tip. So this is 50 microns. So this is really big, and we get a really tiny tip at the bottom here. So we can get broad tips, where we can put nanoparticles on the tip. We can get flat facet tips, where we can put nanoparticles on just that flat facet. And then we can also get extremely sharp needles that have sub 5 nanometer tips in the end. So we're not only using this, we want to try to reconstruct the tip of this tungsten needle. We can also put samples on the object and we can rotate them without a substrate at all. So here's an, uh, an example of a tungsten tip that was rotated about a single axis. Because the team stage is really accurate and we have both full rotation in gamma and alpha, so it's a tilt-rotate type of stage, we can take 65 images of this crystalline tungsten needle where the 110 axis is along this axis, and you can see that the axis of this needle, this axis, is actually tilted a little bit with respect to the goniometer axis. So what we need to do is use both alpha and gamma to keep this object on, on axis at every single tilt angle. So you can see planes of atoms along this direction in every single axis. So we're tilting exactly around all of those um, uh, planes along this direction. And we do that by, we can hit all di many different orientations and many different um, crystalline uh, axes of the, of the tip. And we can do that by changing, the, the, by changing alpha and gamma at the same time. So if our object is, is not perpendicular to the, the tilt axis, it will, it will rotate, process. But if, we, if it processes a little bit, we can tilt it back. And then it'll process a little bit, and then we can tilt it back. And so this is a, a reconstruction of that very small tip. So this is 5 nanometers, so it's less than five, about 5 nanometers at the tip. We have crystalline tungsten in the center and amorphous tungsten on the outside. And so using the uh, equally slope tomography method, we can reconstruct the crystalline tung tungsten in the, in the inside with zero background. There's no substrate here. So it's full plus or minus 90 degree rotation. And so here's, an, here's a, a slices of all of these um, tilting of, of the 3D reconstruction of this object. And that's difficult to see. But you can see here, I'm going to, I made a three-dimensional representation of this object. I'm going to tilt it onto different axes. So this is all in the computer. And we can see at different axes, we can actually see the columns of atoms as we hit certain zone axes. And we don't only look along just this angle, so just perpendicular to the axis of the tip. We can actually look along the tip because we have all the information, almost all the information, and we can actually see what the crystalline structure is along the axis of the tip as well. And so this is where we're going. So by doing state-of-the-art sample preparation, acquisition, and then reconstruction and analysis, we're hoping to be able to get to atomic resolution tomography and be able to tell where all the atoms are in, in the structure. And it's getting really, really close. So I'll tell you just real quick, at the National Center for Electron Microscopy, I have to plug my own center. 
Um, we're an international user facility in sunny California. So when it's winter here, you can come up there. It's really nice. Um, we are an advanced S, uh, STEM and TEM facility with two aberration corrected STEM 10 microscopes. They're double corrected, so you can get aberration correction in either. Those are the team microscopes. We have EELS, X-ray, an advanced X-ray detector, spectroscopy, tomography, and many more applications. So we have international users from Mexico, Germany, Japan, many other places, and hopefully Brazil, maybe sometime soon. We have 14 staff, 10 different microscopes. You can use everything from a Titan to a CM300 that's probably older than me to um, uh, the uh, advanced team microscopes, and you just have to write a proposal. It's about three pages, and it's uh, reviewed by an external committee. So talk, talk to me about that, or if anyone has any questions about the theory of electron tomography or some of the applications, please let me know. Thank you.